Well, 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 you have finally got here. You are listening to the Erskine Music Podcast. Here by popular demand, we discuss life, culture, Christ, and of course, music. These half-hour broadcasts are perfect for a commute, coffee time, chat, or any other gap in your schedule where you want to put great content. So without further ado, let's join the conversation today, already in progress. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and you're back at the Erskine Music Show. I'm so glad that you guys are here. In your face, sucker! All right, don't cry! Don't cry! The Methodists. And inter- interestingly enough, all of the stock footage today is of Methodists who are now crying because their denomination has split into three, four, five, six, seven. Well, the Methodists kind of saw this coming. We're going to be talking about that today. Denominational split that's happened amongst the Methodists with the issue of sexuality over some other issues as well as discipline and some other things that we'll get into today. We'll be thinking about that in, in reference to what's going on in the world of Christians and the world of church world and all these different things. And so if you're not aware of what's going on with the Methodist, you need to be aware of it because coming soon to a denomination near you, <laughs> these issues will be coming up. There's the button. <laughs> All right, let me see who this is. This is Ready to Harvest. He's got 150,000 subscribers. 150,000 subscribers? That's a lot of subscribers. But when you see this guy give this uh, very clear expose of what's going on with the Methodist Church, you'll see he's done his research. He has done his homework. And in fact, wearing that cardigan, you know that he does his homework every time. Never made a B in his whole life. All right, so he never <laughs> never made a B in his whole life. And... Um, What's going on here? What's going on here? My nose running today. Seasonal allergies up in this thing. If you're in Nashville, Tennessee, welcome to allergy season. All right. And uh, welcome to cicada season in Nashville, Tennessee. But let's get to it today. The Methodist Church will probably split in two over homosexuality. And that's bad for us all. This is CNN that's talking about that. That was 2020, and he's going to update us on what has happened in, recently in the last couple of days. I think I sped this up so that we would not be uh, taking all day to do this. All right, playback speed. Let's get on to her. Uh, sure, sure, sure. All right, let's get to going here, and then I'm going to be stopping it along and making some comments. Comment section is turned on. Let's go. Church has nearly completed a split that has taken five years, and things will never be the same. Some inevitable changes are happening, but also there are massive changes to the denomination that were intentionally made at the General Conference, which just ended on May 3rd. We'll get into those, but first, let's... Oh, yeah, and by the way, if you're Methodist and you're out there and you're like, hey, this is a nuance that I want to add to it, I would love to have, you know, I'll prioritize and get you guys up to the top of the show in terms of the comments that are coming in, but just want to make sure that, you know, we're fact-checking this because sometimes people will get on and they'll talk about Southern Baptist. Now, I'm not Southern Baptist, but I used to be Southern Baptist, and when I hear people talk about Southern Baptist, even though they're my little brother now, um, sometimes they don't talk about them appropriately or correctly, and so if this general conference information if any of this is skewed or you want to add any insight to it then please jump in the comment section and then we'll prioritize and get that on the screen so far as i can fact check you let's do a quick overview of what happened the united methodist church has been the second largest protestant denomination in the usa for a long time i don't know if you guys knew that they were the second largest um i guess when i'm looking at this chart here if you guys are looking at it as well catholic church we'll have that discussion another day um non-denominational that can mean almost anything. Uh, I would say I'm numbered among the non-denominationals, 21 million who are here. The Southern Baptist, my little brother and friend and place where I graduated from, I'm looking at my seminary degree. Thank you, Southwestern. Uh, at any rate, Southern Baptist Convention and the United Methodists who are not united anymore. And you can see the denominational numbers that are there. Now, they could have left the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints of the Last Days False Prophets off of there. That's number five. They could have left the Muslim estate off of there. Um, and you see uh, the different offshoots that are going on there. And I'll say this. <clears throat> we value and we should value religious liberty to the extent where we are free to share the gospel, 
free to receive the gospel, free to respond to the gospel. And a lot of the conversation that takes place with reference to how language is used, it's going to penalize free speech, penalize religious liberty. Rightly do we respond to that. But you do know that in a culture where you have such rampant, uh, like uh, on Sunday, our country of prayer was North Korea. We were obviously praying because we know the persecution that takes place in that country. There's an underground church that's there. Uh, North Koreans are listening, but they can't find them. They can't stop them. They won't be able to stop them. The, the church will continue to grow and they will continue to flourish underneath the nose of some of the most oppressive regimes that are out there. In a place where, it, in the United States of America, where we have freedom, we have opportunity, it does give people the opportunity also to jump in and say, hey, look, I'm also a Christian and should be numbered among those who are Christians. Even though I'm Latter-day Saint, we're just Christians like everybody else. And so you have to parse out the falseness of a cult like that, the Jehovah's Witness, another false, abominable, hellish cult that is out there. You have to parse out various uh, mainline denominations who have strayed so far from the scripture. And so you have this whole array of churches that are out there. Some are true churches, some are not true churches. What dictates the truth and the validity of a ch true church that is teaching the true message of Christ with the true gospel is the scriptures themselves. There's a reason why we get out our Bibles and there's a reason why we we look into the scriptures and hopefully have the Holy Spirit to help the scriptures look into our own heart and discern and divide and decipher what's truly there because there's no plumb line for us making this thing up. And I will say this about the Methodists, if I, I could, I've got some Methodist friends. Oh, I've got a hole in my jeans too. Dang it. Didn't know that. But uh, I've got some Methodist friends who I've known for years who are faithful followers of Christ who have been grieved over this. And, and you know, if you're one of those who has been grieved over the situation, my encouragement to you is to stick with the scriptures. And I'll share some stories a little bit later about a tour that I was on and how I was introduced to the new wing of the Methodist. But you'll want to hear this information before we get to the, the global Methodist. Behind the Southern Baptist Convention. However, unlike the SBC, which is nearly entirely a United States denomination, the UMC is international. And so historically, the United States congregations weren't entirely self-determined. I don't know that that's necessarily true for the Southern Baptists because of some of their work in the IMB, the International Missions Board. Um, but I can see why they said that. As delegates from Africa, Asia, and Europe, among others, could also influence the denomination's policies. Mm -hmm. The split of the denomination has been widely reported on during the past five years, and the issue at the forefront is sexuality. Mm -hmm. Every four years, the denomination holds a general conference, and in 2016, the issue of sexuality was tabled, pushed off to the future. All right, so you got to get this belt. I'm not advertising for these jokers. Get that joke over here. I'm not buying your belt or any of your stuff. Get off here. You don't give me no money. By religion news service was foreboding why United Methodist chaos on sexuality issues will continue. Well, continue it did. And in a nearly unprecedented move, instead of... I don't know if you guys uh, watch or listen to the briefing with Al Mohler. I was listening to that yesterday and thought, Al Mohler's been sounding this alarm for many years that the denomination delaying actually deciding on these issues is just a delaying the inevitable. Because if you're not coming to this issue with the plumb line of scripture and it's just culturally conditioned or situationally conditioned, then you're always going to have this sort of tension that is taking place there until somebody says, this is thus what the scriptures say. Our, and this is important. Listen to me. Listen to every single word that I'm saying here. Our creeds, our confessions, our denominational designations and distinctives do not accrue to the same level of scripture. And so there's a phrase that's going to be brought out here uh, that in, is in reference to what the Methodists have been looking at in the way that they see and view and have historically viewed homosexuality. That is something that they have begun to argue with because is this simply confession by way of what early Methodists have said? Or is this something that the scriptures, we believe, affirms what the scriptures teach? The scriptures are the final authority. The scriptures are the final authority. The scriptures should be the first and the scriptures should be the final authority on these matters. But we'll see how, going down the line, church authority and structure will often confuse this issue. 
of waiting four years to deal with the matter, a special general conference was called for 2019. Mm -hmm. Only once in the history of the United Methodist Church has a special general conference been called back in 1970 to tie up loose ends on the merger of the Methodist Church with the Evangelical United Brethren. The 2019 special conference took place, and one of the firebrand issues was what to do with the wording in the Here's UNC's the Book of Discipline, which said, the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. All right, let me stop there. Well, that certainly gives a sense of why people enjoy this show. Very engaging, very heartfelt. We will return to the conversation in a few moments, but first, let's thank our sponsors and you for all your awesome support. Moody Radio's Dawn and Steve Morning Show, Life Action Ministries, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and Holt International. Thanks so much to our partners who make such a difference. Thanks, Jason. This is Don. And this is Steve of Don and Steve in the Morning on Moody Radio. You can find us online at donandsteve.org or you can listen through the Moody Radio app. And as friends of the Erskine Music Show, we always enjoy the variety of topics our friend has on his show. So on behalf of our show, thanks Erskine for bringing great Christ-centered topics to the people. All right, let's get back to the show. This is where it gets good. This is a true statement. The practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching, Christian doctrine, Christian practice. And so that is the statement that the book of discipline, when it comes to, and correct me if I'm wrong, Methodist, when it comes to, will we discipline churches who are not in accordance with this? Will we discipline bishops? Will we discipline leadership that is not teaching in accordance to this? Well, if that's what your documents say and your documents are founded upon Scripture, then there should be some action taken toward those who are openly and flagrantly, as it were, <laughs> flying the flag <laughs> of homosexuality and actually practicing it within the midst of their congregation. And one of the things that we'll find is that, no, there was no discipline for those that were coming out, living in these types of lifestyles, propagating these types of lifestyles. In fact, to some degree, it was becoming popular among certain denominations, among certain parts of the country, as we'll see this demographic brand. This is actually a pretty fantastic video that is very educational to help folks who are not Methodists understand what the Methodists are contending with. Their documents say this, their belief of scripture is that homosexuality, and then obviously you can go down gradation wise and you can begin to see, well, homosexuality, some of the gender confusion issues, all the trans alphabet soup mafia type stuff that's all that's out there should all be covered under this. And it is the practice of these things, the propagation of these things is incompatible with Christian teaching. You are teaching something that is not biblical. You are teaching something that should get you disciplined to correctively bring you to the point where you're teaching what scripture teaches, which is your responsibility, or disciplined as it were subsequently out of the church to the point where we say, or they would say, because I'm not Methodist, you are not a part of what we are. Don't call yourself what we are. And I think for, for people in the modern era, we need to remind people that there is a definition of Christianity that is predicated on who Christ is. Our Christology is such that if you don't believe Christ, the God-man, fully God, fully man, the only one who is able to redeem us from our sins and then propitiates our sins through his life. If you don't believe that about Christianity, you can say what you want to. You can tell me all the books that you've read. You can tell me all the people that you've hung out with. You can even talk to me about the brilliance of the music that you've listened to. You can even have written songs, but you are not a Christian if you don't believe in Christ the way that the Bible describes him. And so for those who are out there who have a substandard view of Christ, well, he was a good man, he was a good ethical teacher, but he was not fully divine, whether that be Muslim or whether that be in some way some uh, some of the spurious teaching of the Mormons who are out there. Listen, 
if you're Mormon and you're watching this, hopefully you're still watching this because you are now recognizing that your substandard teaching with regards to who Christ is makes you not a Christian. You should not be on the page listed as Christian denominations. And for those who are going to flagrantly disobey and disavow what the Bible teaches in reference to sexuality, male, female, gender issues, um, the flourishing of humanity as it relates to us, that is not a Christian teaching. It doesn't matter how you feel about that. It doesn't matter what you think about that. It doesn't matter what your friends are doing in response to that. And it should not matter even if you go to a particular church that is saying, hey, you guys come on in. You guys can do that at this church. In fact, I do that at this church. It's okay at this church. Put a rainbow flag up at your church. What should happen, what should have happened, and they'll talk about this in just a few moments, is somebody gets wind of that and said, no, 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 no. Heck no. You're going to be disciplined. You're going to be sat down or you're going to be put outside the Methodist church. Now, that's the that's the split there. That's the controversy. And you'll see how close this vote is in reference to the numbers of people who are believing this and saying these types of things. But this is, friends, the phrase that is hotly contested, or at least was. And you'll see the breakdown of it. The decision was made by 53% to 47%, and the result was to keep the wording. Another 53% to 47%. Let me, let me roll that back just so you guys can see. Just go see it. It's right there. Well, I don't know if I can roll it back. Yeah, there it is. 53-47. That's almost a 50-50 split. That is half the people, and rightly, <laughs> the 53% were in the right and saying, yeah, we're going to keep the wording here because that is uh, consistent with Christian theology and Christian teaching. 47% said, nah. Maybe we don't do that. And so we already knew back in 2016 when this issue uh, in the general convention uh, came up, general conference came up, excuse me, we already knew back then the Methodists are in trouble. That plane is losing altitude. That mainline denomination, it will go down. And so as the years, if they try to table discussions, if they try to bring in other groups to kind of buoy uh, the vote, uh, this evangelical brethren group, um, and, and assume some other denominations, they still couldn't stop that plane from going down. It was The altitude was so low that it was going to hit that mountain, and it has. And the result was to keep the wording. Another key thing that happened at the special conference was a path for churches to leave the UMC. The United Methodist Church holds the right to church property, and bishops can also appoint and move ministers. That is to say, under typical conditions, a congregation can't decide they want to leave. Sure, people can get up. For All right, so this is the deal. The way in the path forward for them to split was made. Um, I don't know if I tell my story now. Maybe I'll tell my story now. Yeah, I'll tell my story now. So those of you who have been following along with Erskine Music and the Erskine Music Travels know that I had a concert in Kansas, Kingman, Kansas, as a matter of fact. And one of the churches that I played at with a, was a Methodist church. Now... I'm going into the concert knowing full well that I'm on the Big God Tour. This was last, uh, this was the end, this was sort of near the end of the Big God Tour. Your theme, message, everything behind that tour was just centered on the largeness of our God, the uniqueness of the message that he's given to us, and how profound that is. And so I'm playing the songs, doing the things, talking points, sharing songs, all the different things with the Big God Tour. And I'm thinking I'm going into a Methodist church, and there will be an audience there, presumably people who are from the Methodist church, who are listening to what it is that I'm saying, and this could go one of two ways. This could either be a night of revival in the sense that people are hearing things that they've never heard before. We actually, Nobody's ever told us these things. Oh, yes, yeah, actually in your Bible. Or this could be a night of, you know, perhaps Erskine getting the, pull the power out. Get that guy off the stage. Who knows? I will often step into musical events and situations Sometimes when I'm on tour and sometimes when I'm touring with other people and not know who set this up and what's about to happen. But that's OK. I'm there for a reason. And so I'm doing the Erskine music thing like we're going at it. We're we're talking scripture. We're talking life. We're talking Christ. We're talking awesome, awesome music, which you're about, you're about to hear some of that in a moment. And like that, it, it's a good evening. It's a great evening. In fact, the pastor of this church comes to me, he's like, man, you were talking about so many things there that are things that we talk about there. And I was like, oh, tell me more, tell me more. And so he just started talking about, you know, we're a global Methodist church. 
Global Methodist Church. And I was like, tell me more about the Global Methodist. And he's like, the Global Methodists have split off. They're the conservative branch that actually believes and teaches the Bible. And I don't think he said it like that. That's my my interpretation of what it was that he said. And he's like, so I just said, tell me more. Tell me more about what's going on with the Global Methodists. And as he began to tell me about it, I thought there there is a wing of Methodists that's out there, big head, who are poised to be that 53%. Then he began to tell me the... The difficulty of that has been sort of this long process of having to purchase the building, having to sort of reconstruct, sign, brand, all those different things because the United Methodists hold property rights on each of their buildings. However, in knowing that there was perhaps eventually going to be a split, they relaxed some of those things so that people have a pathway to be able to leave the denomination and continue on as a church. Now that is, I don't know if I want to call that foresight, but it certainly is, speaks to what would have been the death nail, I think, of the entire Methodist denomination had they said, no, we're going to keep the property rights of these buildings. And so you global Methodists need to go out and find new buildings, find a completely different life, and we're going to hold the property rights because that, and I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. If you're part of the general council or general convention or general, I keep wanting to say convention. If you're part of the general conference, I bet you had to face this issue. I bet you had to face this issue. And I could be wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm not wrong. You had to face this issue. If we hold the property rights to these buildings, yet all the people leave, you will be sitting there with buildings that become an albatross to us. We'll be sitting there with buildings that are empty with no one in them that we are still paying property taxes on. I know you had to face that issue and thought to yourselves, wouldn't it be better to actually get the money from the building, a buyout as it were, have the congregation still there. Okay. We don't believe the same thing, but they're still there. They're still doing their thing as opposed to y'all don't believe what it is that we believe y'all are kicked out of the de denomination. Now uh, we're, we've split, but we're still holding the building, but there's nobody in the building. That would have been a death nail to the Methodist because it would have bankrupted you. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong, but I'm not wrong. Anyway, let's keep going. From the pews and go somewhere else, but the church's property and finances belong to the UMC. But the 2019 General Conference made a way for churches to leave. Mm -hmm. Since the decision was to keep the denomination stance opposing the practice of homosexuality, initially, it seemed that the more liberal churches would be the ones who would exit. However, in reality, a movement of traditionalist churches formed that decided they would leave. Some reasons for this included that how the denomination's policies were enforced depended upon the bishop and the particular annual mm -hmm. conference a congregation was under. In many conferences, churches that were openly affirming of the practice of homosexuality were not being disciplined, and yep. ministers and bishops themselves in homosexual relationships were being permitted. Additionally, well, you probably already know that when you hear that sound, there's music on the way. After all, this is kind of a music show. Sit back and enjoy. All the music can be easily found on your favorite digital distribution channels. Turn up the volume and here we go. I'm a self-made man with my well-laid plans And I was taught to do it on my own But I've tried and failed And I've been derailed From dust you picked me up and now I know
this matter would never go away until the denomination changed. Every general conference would be another fight. And instead of focusing on ministry, the issue of sexuality would divide the denomination year after year. So they left. The deadline to... Now, this is interesting. All of this is interesting to me because as I'm traveling around and doing shows and playing music, I am ending up in some of these places in the highways and byways of life. And the, the audience and the reception and uh, the ability to have some of these conversations on the ground in these places is incredible. If you're a traveling music artist, you're going to come across some of these places. Some of the conversations are incredible. I found it insightful when he was talking about the fact that initially, since the vote was 53% of those who were in favor of disciplining clarifying the stance on homosexuality that the ones who would leave are the ones who are in the minority but this was a surprising reversal of fortune in the sense that the ones who are actually concerned about doctrine and actually concerned about church discipline were the ones who decided to leave because they said if we're basically split down the middle if half of the people who are there are not practicing what it is that even the documents say if they haven't been doing it before they're certainly not going to start doing it now because they're progressive liberal not followers of <laughs> our doctrine, whatever the case may be. And so the more conservative ones who were the 53% who were in the majority were the ones who left. And I think probably they saw the writing on the wall that even though we retain the right to be the minority or the majority and we're on the side of right, if it's going to be unenforceable, this is going to continually be an issue. This is going to continually plague us. And I think they said, you know what, let's make a clean split. Let's do what it is that we need to do to acquire it properly. And since we're on the side of right, since we're on the side of having now more executive power, um, let's go ahead and do this now so that we begin to move in the direction of faithfulness as we see the scriptures teaching those things. This will be interesting because I would imagine I'm going to, can I get my Nostradamus hat? Where's my, my tinfoil hat? Black Stradamus is about to make a prediction here that you will see a radical well, let me let him talk here. I want you to see what's, I want you to see this map because you guys are going to think, Erskine, you're a genius. How did you, how did you know that this was about to happen to the Methodists? I don't want you to think Black, Black Stradamus is here and that I've come up with some kind of incantation. <laughs> Watch this map that he's about to show and I'll tell you my prediction and what's about to happen. The leave under the special provision granted by the 2019 special conference was December 31st, 2023. Mm -hmm. And one quarter of the United States congregations went through the process and officially exited the UMC. Yep. There were over 30,500 congregations before the split, over 7,600 left. And now mm -hmm. there's just short of 22,000. Mm -hmm. The percentage of people leaving the UMC over this by issue is at least order twice of as large as similar exits from other mainline Protestant Echo. denominations over sexuality, Eesh. such as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America Ooh. and Presbyterian Church North USA. The majority Church. of churches leaving joined a newly created denomination, the Global Methodist Church, which in January Whoa. 2024 claimed 4,336 congregations. Things were not the same everywhere. Here's the different annual conferences or jurisdictions of the UMC this in is the a United cool States. Map. The Lewis Center for Church Leadership at Wesley Theological Seminary produced a report on churches that left the UMC. 50% of the churches that left the UMC came from just the southeastern jurisdiction. All right, there's the southeast. There we be. Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, North Georgia, South Georgia, Florida, North Alabama, West Florida, <laughs> and Mississippi. That southeast region there, strongly conservative but strongly not conservative in, in some regards. But here's here's what I'm going to predict. I'm going to put my prognostication hat on. I'm going to predict that you're going to see a dwindling among these places that are strongly and staunchly, at least more ardently, faithfully, consistently, biblically aligned. You will see the strengthening of, of that global Methodist denomination among those that are at 50% or more. And you will see a dwindling of those in the progressive ideology. And you're seeing that denominationally wide. So it wasn't like I made a major prognostication. It's not like Tom Rainer's going to call me today and be like, sir, I now need to have you come and speak to me. Uh, there will not be any of that. But uh, you're seeing that denomination from denom not just this denomination, but denominationally, you are seeing the churches that are actually growing, the churches that are, have staying power, as it were, are the churches that are teaching the Bible, holding people accountable, 
exercising church discipline. You say, why? People don't want that. Well, no, people do want that if people are followers of Christ. They do want the full counsel of God being taught to them. They do want the full, as it were, <laughs> the full experience of what Christianity is. These congregations that dumb down the message of Christ, and listen to me, if you're one such congregation or congregational leader, these congregations that dumb down the message of Christ and tell people, you can do whatever the heck you want to do around here. We don't teach anything. We don't believe anything. I'm going to tell you this over the next couple of years, more and more people will begin to say, well, we don't have time to do nothing. We would rather go do something with our Sundays. We would rather go do something that we want to do with our lives. Why even come to a building or come to a place where nobody believes anything, teaches anything, or does anything? And denominationally, people are beginning to see that time and time again, People are those congregations are not growing. They don't have staying power. Just believe whatever the heck you want to believe. Well, that's fine. I'll come there for a little bit. Now I feel good about myself. Now I don't need it anymore. And so you will begin to see that happen more and more among this global Methodist group. They will grow the, I don't even know if they're going to call themselves because they're not united anymore. These progressive Methodists are going to continue to shrink. And I'm glad of it. Jurisdiction in orange. Only 35% of churches in the UMC in the U.S. before the split were from that region. So these churches left at a higher rate. What than is the Texas average. doing? Conversely, the northeastern jurisdiction held 21% of U.S. UMC churches before the split, but only 10% of disaffiliations came from that jurisdiction. All right. So this is this map is showing us the trend lines. And uh, incidentally, when we discuss places that we want to travel, the northeast I don't know if I'm pointing at the Northeast. I don't know where I'm pointing at this point. <laughs> I'm just, I'm pointing all over the place. The Northeast is a place that is extremely desirable for Erskine music to go. Ding! Oh, wait, I got a sound effect for that. The Northwest is a place that's extremely desirable for Erskine music to go. Well, Texas, because it's a nation unto itself. And the Southeast. All right, keep going. Diction. Breaking it down even more finely, here are some of the conferences that lost the most. In the Northwest Texas Conference, 81% left. 81% 50 left in Texas. Now, remember the ones who are leaving are the ones who are conservative, the ones who are teaching the Bible, the ones who care about the fact that homosexuality and these sexual issues will not be taught from their churches. 81% left. That's Texas. That's what I'm talking about, Texas. 52% of North Alabama left. 52% 50 of North Alabama. So this is showing conservative trends, conservative lines. 50% of Texas, 50% of South Georgia, 49. I was surprised that it was 50% in that part of Texas. Uh, I'm from Central Texas. Let's see what we did. 9% of Kentucky, 44% of Central Texas. 44% of Central Texas. To the folks who are watching this from Temple, Texas, I want to say hello. I'll be coming back next month to see you guys so the folks who are in stephenville other places that are out there will be coming to see you guys ferris texas it won't be long i don't know if i'll make it down to austin texas but 44 percent, and i would guarantee you that that's probably around 60 to 70 percent but one of the things that skews that 44 percent that's in central texas it would be much higher you look at the 81 percent that's in the north and the 50 percent that's a little south of that it would be higher but you know what's in the middle of that 44 percent Austin, Texas, keeping Austin weird, keeping Austin progressive, keeping Austin headed straight to hell. And so that really is probably about 60 to 70 percent, but because Austin is such a large population center and so freakishly weird, um, that skewed it down to 44 percent. But I can tell you that's an extremely conservative area. I can tell you that for sure. 43 percent of Alabama, West Florida, 41 percent of North Carolina and 41 percent. And in some of these places where you would expect that it would be higher because it's in the South or the Southeast, please be reminded that some of the population, large population centers is responsible for bringing it down to below uh, 50%, I am sure. We have come to the end of this episode. Don't miss a final word from Erskine. Hey guys, tell your friends about this show. And as always, I look forward to your interactions. Please contact us as you are able. We love to hear from you. Okay, friends, let's go and make a difference.